Good morning. Good to see so many of you here in the sanctuary. And of course, it's always good to join with those of you who are joining us via Armstrong Cable or through Facebook or on the website. Uh, this morning, before we get going here in terms of worship, I want to share just a, a, a few announcements. Um, we'll probably cover them again. I forget almost every week um, to remind folks about how we're taking our offering now during this time. Um, but most of you gathered here have caught on without any announcement. So for those gathered in the sanctuary, we of course have not been doing our traditional offering um, and doxology and all of that during this uh, last year now. And so uh, up in front of at the altar, there is an offering plate and when you, come in, when you come in or out at any time, please you know, leave your offering if that is uh, the way you give. Uh, please do that. For those who are joining us via Armstrong Cable or, again, the Facebook or website, uh, you can mail a check in. Uh, you can drop one off. You can have automatic uh, deposit from your bank or uh, you can check out uh, the multiple ways online that you can give electronically. So all of that, thank you for giving as we have moved through again, as we have moved through this last very challenging year. Thank you to everyone who's been so financially and spiritually supportive of our work together. I also want to uh, say just a, a word of thanks to our choir, uh, to Jen and Jim, who have kept this virtual choir, have both developed it and kept it going. If you are, again, someone here or out there uh, who likes to sing, you do need some um, computer ability. You've got to record. <laughs> some of us are laughing because it's harder for some of us than others. You do need to be able to record yourself. Um, but you don't need to have had a ton of practice. So if you're someone who now this morning will have a, will have a piece from our virtual choir, if you're someone who thinks, oh, that's so wonderful to be able to do that, please, uh, you know, again, check us out online to get the link to uh, connect with Jen Ashba, our music director, or um, always, you can call the office. You can call the office if this is something that, uh, that ha has been a, a, a catch for you to, to do it in another way. Please just call the office, and our office administrator, uh, Patty, will make sure that we get back to you, so... Those are some of the announcements, and we'll cover a few other things later. But back to the welcome. Good morning. Uh, it is good that we are worshiping here together on this. The very last day of February, we have survived another winter month. Um, last day of February and the second Sunday of Lent. So through these days of Lent, as we journey toward Easter... Our guiding theme to worship is, I give up, letting go of hopelessness. Last week, we focused on letting go of hopelessness so that we could pick up the present moment. We looked at the words of Jesus, the kingdom of God is at hand. And this morning, we're going to look at the call of the first disciples as we consider that letting go of hopelessness involves picking up purpose. So that is, our, uh, that is our focus of our worship this morning. So as we begin, as we begin this time of worship, I call you into worship with some of my very favorite words found in our United Methodist hymnal. I've used them quite often. It is the prayer for courage to do justice. It comes to us from Alan Patton, who is a South African author and activist. Uh, many of us probably were introduced to Alan Patton through Cry the Beloved Country that you might have read uh, somewhere along the line in school. But open your ears and your hearts to these words this morning. O oh Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they need not be without succor. Let me not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. 
show me where love and hope and faith are needed and use me to bring them to those places. So open my eyes and my ears that I may this coming day be able to do some work of peace for thee. Amen. That is our call to worship this morning. Open my eyes that I may see. Thank you, Jim. Open our eyes that we might see. This morning, on the second Sunday of Lent, I want you, small and tall people, to make note that uh, what I commented on last week during the children's sermon, that our candles on the altar, that as we move through the season of Lent, one candle will go out every week. So last Sunday, we had six candles burning, and this Sunday, five. So I'm very glad we have a few kids in our sanctuary this morning. So I'm going to direct my story to you all here. That opening hymn talked about opening our eyes to see God in our midst. I thought of all the beauty of this season. Even on these days when the snow is melting and things look a little little dirty in in the side of the roads. But we know that there is a lot of life. A lot of life here and everywhere that God has given us. So, uh, the story for this day is called Life. It says, life begins small, even for the elephants, and then it grows. Beneath the sun and the moon, life grows. Ask any animal on earth. What do you love about life? And the hawk will say sky, and the camel will say sand, and the snake will say grass. The turtle may remain quiet. It has seen much in a hundred years, but the turtle loves life. How could it not? with so much rain on its back. Life is not always easy. 
I don't know if you can all see, there is one small blue bird flying in the midst of a very big storm. There will probably be a stretch of wilderness now and then. But the wilderness eventually ends. And there's always a new road to take. Hmm. Remember this. In every corner of the world, there is something to love. (laughs) And something to protect. And if one day it seems nothing beautiful will ever come your way again, Trust the rabbit in the field and the deer who crosses your path. Trust the wolf and the wild geese who find their way back home. Because all these know something about life. That everything is changing. And it is worth waking up in the morning to see what might happen. Because life begins small and it grows and it grows. Life begins small and it grows. And there's something beautiful to love and protect in every corner of the earth. Amen. Open our eyes, right, that we might see the beauty of God's earth. So this morning, we continue with the uh, Gospel of Mark, with stories that reveal to us and offer us a call to let go of hopelessness and pick up this morning, pick up purpose. Uh, I remind you that Mark moves quickly. We don't linger very long on long passages, but rather uh, the story takes us on a journey. This morning, we hear about Jesus' call to the first disciples. And I share with you from Mark chapter 1, verses 14, oh, excuse me, verses 16 through 20. Well, I'm going to go ahead and read 14. I'm going to read 14 through 20. Because these were the verses that connect us to last week's lesson. So, um, after the temptation of Jesus, we're told, now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Hmm. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for this story about a call and an answer. Hmm. A call and a response. Open this old word to us. Make it new by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, uh, I particularly enjoy reading and preaching from the Gospel of Mark because I like how fast it goes. I like how dense the word is and how, how I guess, terse it would be that the, the Gospel writer tells the stories. These are not passages like the long passages in the Gospel of John where you hear Jesus' long soliloquies about Um, his understanding, those are all so good and holy, but they're hard to get to it, at least from my end. But Mark, 
Mark moves quickly and gives us important details in a very short amount of time. So take this particular passage apart this morning, five verses, right? Jesus at the C, at the C-S-E-A, sees, sees Simon, who's also called Peter, Simon Peter. He sees Peter and Andrew, their brothers, their fishermen, their occupation is fishing. All of this we find out like in one or two verses. He calls them while they are at work. And Jesus says to them, follow me, I will make you fish for people. That is how the New Revised Standard translates that verse. Maybe some of you, like me, learned the song when you were in Sunday school, I will make you fishers of men. I love that song, fishers of men. Um, I talked last week about why I use New Revised Standard. One of the things I like about this translation, and it may not be yours, but is mine, is that it uses inclusive language when appropriate. Because what, what we have come to know is certainly is that Jesus' call for people to be disciples is not just for men. So when Jesus said, I will make you fish for who? All people. We've got to take that in. All people, young and old, men and women, I will make you fish for people. And we're told that immediately, immediately they left their nets and followed him. That word immediately is used 11 times in the first chapter and about 40 in the whole book. So in 15, 15 chapters, 40 times, you know, immediately, immediately, right away, let's go. So... The story moves quickly with an urgency to the message. So they left their nets, they dropped what they were doing, and they followed Jesus. Where there was one, there are now three. There are now three in ministry. And we're told that as Jesus went a little farther, he saw, opened his eyes. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And this time, they were in their boat mending their nets. They were also fishermen, and they were also at work. And we're told immediately, Jesus called them. And then there is that last verse that really packs a punch. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired hands and followed him. I'm not crazy about that verse. Really? You left your dad? in the boat with the hired men. I mean, that's a whole story for another day. But for um, this morning, we will point out what a number of uh, preachers and scholars have pointed out, and it says they didn't leave him alone. They left him in the boat, cared for by the hired hands. Whatever, Whatever underlies how Zebedee might have felt about this, We know the story, that these two sets of brothers, they answered Jesus' call and they went immediately. There was an urgency to it. First there was one, then there were three, and now partway through this first chapter there are five doing the work of God made known through Jesus. This uh, beginning of Mark reads like the beginning of a sprint rather than of a marathon. You know, you feel like, on your mark, get set, go. And the story will move very quickly. And the question that I always ask, and I think it's important for all of us to ask, what does this possibly mean for us? What does this word, because if it's just a story, it is then just a story. But what we believe as Christians is that In a way, we don't even quite understand this Bible, whatever your translation, whatever language you read it in, is a living word that Jesus continues, I mean, that God continues to speak to us through it. So what does it mean? Is the call of Jesus always to mean that we leave our work, that we leave our family behind? I think that might be true for a very few. I think that is true, but for a very few. And and in fact, I think of, if if we just think of that Jesus' call in this story in that way, then it gets the rest of us off the hook, right? It's like, well, 
Well, if it just means that, then I know I'm not called to leave my fill in the blank, who I've been given care for. So what would it mean then? What kind of meaning can we find in our lives connected to these verses today? Now, remember, remember as we listen and attend to this word and try to, you know, be open to what it might mean, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, is that these gospels were written as whole pieces. Last week, as we began into this story, we talked about that in the Greek in which it was written, there were no punct- there were no capitals, no punctuations, and no spaces in words, between words. There were no chapters, there were no verses, there were no headings to tell you what the story was. It was to, re- it was to be read as a whole. So if that is the case, and I believe it is to be true, then we cannot separate those two verses that I started with this morning from the rest of the story. Because if it says that Jesus' words were this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news, then the disciples' response is to that, is to recognizing that the kingdom of God is now. And they need to repent and believe in the good news. For Simon Peter, for Andrew, for James, and for John, this literally meant dropping what they were doing, their work, their family responsibilities, and following Jesus. That is what repenting meant for them. To believe in the good news. What we can see here, it's not just a head thing, And it's even not just a heart thing. But to repent means to change one's way and to move forward in a way that maybe one hadn't done before. It is an everyday response. An everyday response. My husband, Dave, and I, every morning, share a morning devotion from uh, a monthly guide called Give Us This Day. And I think the... I think the subtitle is something like um, good news for um, modern Catholics. Uh, My husband is Roman Catholic, and we've over the years shared many of our traditions um, in an ecumenical family. But um, we found this morning prayer to be really important both to us individually and as a couple. There is a pattern of prayer that would be familiar to all of us here, I think, and um, whatever our religious uh, tradition is. There's a psalm reading. There's a scripture. There's a litany of prayer, and each day you're given suggested, uh, um, suggested petitions for that day, whether it be health care, care workers or the environment. There's always something. There's a place to add your own prayers for that day. Each day offers a story, um, lifts up a person. It can be a person from the Bible or an early martyr, a civil rights leader or a saint. And then there is a reflection for that day that comes from a variety of people. Well, last Sunday, the reflection was from Pope Francis about this very work of repenting and beginning Lent and following Jesus in this season. And as I thought about these words this week as it relates to the story about the call this morning, I I decided I would share with you um, these words from Pope Francis. This was written uh, as part of a sermon for the first Sunday of Lent. He writes this, repent and believe in the gospel. That is, believe in this good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. In our lives, we need to convert every day. And the church invites us to pray for this. In fact, we are never sufficiently oriented toward God. And so we must continually direct our hearts and our minds toward him. In order to do this, we need to have the courage to reject all that takes us off course. 
the false values which deceive us by subtly flattering our ego. Rather, we must entrust ourselves to the Lord, to his goodness, and to his project of love for each of us. Lent is a time of repentance, yes, but it is not a time of sorrow. It's a time of penance, but it is, again, not a time of sorrow or of mourning. It's a joyous and serious commitment to strip ourselves of selfishness and to renew ourselves according to the grace of our baptism. Only God can give us true happiness. It's useless to waste our time seeking it anywhere else, in wealth, in pleasure, in power, in career. The kingdom of God is the realization of all our aspirations, because at the same time, it is the salvation of humankind and the glory of God. On this first Sunday of Lent, we are invited to listen carefully and to hear Jesus' appeal to convert and to believe in the gospel. We're exhorted to begin the journey toward Easter with commitment to embrace evermore the grace of God who wishes to transform the world into a kingdom of justice and peace and fraternity. To repent to believe in the gospel. That was our last week's story that leads us this morning to the call of Jesus to come follow me. And the response of the disciples then and now, then those four and now all of us, is to do that very thing, to listen to the call, to open our eyes that we might see and to follow Jesus, to daily, right? It's that daily part. It's not that once in a lifetime give your life to Jesus story. It is that daily listening for God's word and turning toward what will bring hope and joy and justice and peace to our lives and to others. To pick up purpose. Sometimes purpose isn't what we thought, right? Sometimes purpose isn't anything we can check off our list. Maybe the purpose this morning comes in those words of what the disciples said yes to, to be with Jesus, to bring about the kingdom of justice and peace and righteousness on earth, to live the love. So we are exhorted this morning to do that, to pick up the purpose of following Jesus with our life and with our loves. Our virtual choir has, uh, helps us consider what it means to walk with Jesus and to follow Jesus in this next piece.
Thank you very much. We want Jesus to walk with us and we want to follow him both. So this morning we give thanks for that. We give thanks for the call on our lives. We give thanks for the beauty of music and the comfort of one another. We give thanks for uh, vaccines and uh, treatments that are unfolding in our community and around the country as we continue to pray for um, those who are waiting. We give thanks for the coming of spring, quite simply, uh, the coming of robins. This week when I was out, I saw a flock of robins. Um, right, so glad for the promise of spring. This morning, we also come with so many concerns. Uh, we've been asked to bring um, before the community the prayers for the family and friends of Bill Bragg, who passed away um, after an extended period of suffering. So we are glad for his release and his welcome into heaven, and we pray for his family and friends. Uh, we continue to pray for those who are recovering from storm damage and um, places from Texas and all through the South. Um, we pray for those who continue to pro provide care, uh, whether they be uh, in law enforcement and firefighters, EMTs, people that plow our roads and uh, care for others in care facilities. Uh, we pray for them. So into this season of Lent, we remember that God is with us. Let us pray. Oh God, we give thanks that you walk with us. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the presence of the risen Christ, we are not alone. Thank you for that reminder this morning. As we seek to repent of our sins, as we seek to turn our lives back to you in this journey, Give thanks this day for the coming of spring, for cures not only of diseases we, we experience here, but for those around the world. We give thanks for a new vaccine and pray for an end to this pandemic. We pray, oh God, also in thanksgiving for those who work for cures to cancer and heart disease, for those seeking treatment that they might receive it. Oh God, this day, we pray for the world, for persons who we will never see, but you will see, for all who grieve, names we know and names known only to you, for persons making difficult decisions these days, whether, we may, whether it relates to finances or family, for work or health care, oh God, guide our decision making. Guide our decision making. And this day, this day, oh God, we come before you offering our confession that we have not followed you, we have not answered the call to be disciples, that we have uh, denied we even knew you by the way we lived by what we said or failed to say, did or failed to do. Forgive us. Forgive us this day and set us back on your path. And so in all of this, we give thanks for forgiveness that has come to us through Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection. And now it is in his power in the power of his name, that we can pray to you as one family, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so in closing, as we go forth, a reminder, if you have not already, please check out the uh, daily devotions. And on our Facebook page, you can um, 
the, the picture of the day that you're invited to respond to. It's been kind of fun. Um, a reminder that on Sunday evenings, we have a men's study. Immediately following this service, we uh, continue our Lenten study, the, some joining us in person, some joining via Zoom. There's a number of meetings coming up uh, this week, and there are also some news online about ordering Easter flowers. So um, all of that, again, uh, check us out on our website or call the office if you'd like a hard copy of um, our schedule to be sent to you. With that, um, we commit ourselves to following. So if you are able here in the sanctuary, I would invite you to stand for two verses of our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord. been called and now we are sent to be people of goodwill and Christ's love in the world. So uh, take that with you, that call in your response. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>